Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to tell you a story about how we have been involved with creating sustainable and extremely affordable medical devices here at the University of Utah. Uh, I come from industry, so I come from a classic uh, capitalist background, for-profit companies. And when I arrived in 2007, we set up a program for biomedical engineering undergraduates to partner them with clinician ideas. So all biomedical engineering students, and we have about 60 every year, they have to take a required two semester course in design. And our value proposition was that all physicians have an idea for something new or improved, but very few of them know how to work on it. And all engineering students, all biomedical engineering students need a project to work on, and they don't know what the needs in the clinic are. So it was fairly straightforward. We created this partnership of clinical experts and bioengineering students. There's a two semester class. Um, and we spun out a lot of great projects since 2007. We start the beginning of the year by just providing them with one slide. So it's a poorly defined project. And at the beginning of the class, the students are a little bit confused because there's no textbook for them to go to. They don't know what the questions are going to be on the exam. They have no idea what's going to come out. Here's, here's an example. Um, this is the value chain that we provide. So we have the healthcare need, we get the idea, it comes into our Utah Bio Design Program, we partner the students with the clinicians. We then use the translational machinery at the University of Utah in order to create business enterprises around some of these ideas. And <clears throat> this creates uh, downstream revenue sources for the university. There are entrepreneurs who are involved, there's venture capitalists involved, there's intellectual property involved, and it's a classic capitalist business development exercise that we see in this country quite often. Uh, this is an example of one of the projects. Uh, Colin Cowley, who's a cardiologist, he um, performs interventional cardiology on pediatric patients. He uses guide wires and he uses snares, and he came to us and he asked, um, could one of your student teams integrate a guide wire and a snare in order to make a guidable snare? So this was the actual slide that was presented to the students at the, be at the beginning of the class, and they worked on it for two semesters. We have them go through a typical medical device design exercise where they have to follow the FDA mandates for design uh, for design control. So they have to understand the need, they build requirements, they then build specifications, they develop prototypes and verification test plans, they test the prototypes to the specifications, and we break it down into two semesters, design input and design output. Um, so in this case, they developed a uh, very nice working model, all of the documentation, there's intellectual property that's applied for. This has gone through the Technology Ventures Department at the University of Utah um, and has received follow-on funding. I think there's over $100,000 in funding now, and it is, a, uh, it is a startup company here at the University of Utah. Another project, uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon came to us and asked if there was some way that the students could come up with a way of developing some sort of a injury detector for, the, uh, for esophageal injury during cervical spine surgery. So in an anterior approach to cervical si spine surgery, you have to retract the esophagus out of the way. You go in with a lot of uh, cutting and polishing tools, and sometimes the esophagus is injured. If the esophagus is injured, the mortality and uh, mor morbidity is, is um, quite dramatic, and there's no way for the surgeons to tell very easily what um, whether or not the esophagus has been nicked. The student team came up with a dual balloon system. They actually developed a very specialized type of polyurethane balloon that would seal the esophagus above and below where the uh, intervention is taking place, and they fill, that, fill the esophagus with a dye if the esophagus is nicked or cut or injured. Uh, the dye will leak out, and it shows up at the end of the procedure using uh, UV light. So over the last few years, since 2007, we've really validated this approach where we can take clinician ideas, even poorly defined clinician ideas, put them into the hands of the students, and the students do a terrific job. Uh, at the beginning, it's a little bit confusing. There's a lot of understanding that needs to take place as they develop, fr further develop the needs and the requirements. 
in 2009, I received an email, and there were two things that were notable about this email. Uh, it came in with, with, of course, dozens and dozens of other emails during the day. And one thing that was notable was that it was from Rich Brown, who is the dean of the College of Engineering. The other thing that was notable was that it contained a picture of a 12-foot snowman. Ray, you, you remember this. And the email, uh, it turns out that Ray Price's son was dating Rich Brown's daughter. And Ray met Rich, and of course, Ray being the resourceful individual that he is, he asked Rich if he could uh, put him in touch with engineers at the university who could help to develop devices that could be used in resource poor settings. Uh, the email that came from Rich read, Dear Ray, thanks for your message about possible collaboration. I'm forwarding this to a number of people who I think may be interested in some aspect of your dream. They should feel free to forward it to others. Best of luck in this worthy enterprise. He also went on to say that uh, here's a picture of Frosty, which is a very remarkable 12-foot snowman. Rich went on to say that, the, uh, being the engineer that he is, he doesn't think physics would allow you to build a snowman much bigger. Um, me being a very busy assistant professor, I responded to Ray, and I tried to blow him off as much as I could, and as nicely as I could. Uh, my email back to Ray reads, Dear Ray, from my perspective, we don't have many ongoing programs for progressing these types of initiatives within the university. Our biodesign program is designed to work on internally generated product ideas, and I believe that the Lausanne Center is interested in for-profit business models as well. With that said, there are numerous creative solutions that may be possible, and other folks are likely to provide you with additional ideas. So that was my way of saying, hey, uh, Ray, you know, we're doing this for profit, and the ideas have to come from within the university, so we can use the entrepreneurial engine at the university in order to spin these out as companies and develop long-term revenue streams. Um, a couple of days later, I was exercising, and I think I had time to really think about it, and my brain tissue was more fully oxygenated than it usually is. And I thought to myself, why can't we do this? Why can't we have students at the university work on some of these ideas that don't create intellectual property and that don't create downturn revenue streams, that don't involve the translational engine at the university? I spoke with my partner, Kelly Broadhead, and we decided that we would ask the students. So the next year, we submitted several ideas to the students, and this is what we do at the beginning of the first semester. We provide them with a number of ideas, so that one PowerPoint slide, and they actually rank their ideas so that they can select which ones they work on. We try to give them one of their top uh, first or second choices. And here's one of the ideas that we gave them. Here's a, here's a picture of Ray. Um, that I that I love to show, but here's here's one of the ideas that we gave them. Ray asked, "Is there some way that you could come up with a universal laparoscopic light source? Because we go into the field, and oftentimes these uh, light sources are individualized per manufacturer. There's no universal light source. They're very expensive. The light bulb that you see um, down in the corner there." is hundreds of dollars to replace, and we know that illumination technology is getting cheaper and cheaper and more expensive. In addition, these don't run off batteries, they run off, uh, they run off main power, and when the power goes out, the light source goes out. The students worked on this for a year, and this is, uh, this is their design. I don't have a picture of the actual device, but there are a couple things that are very clever about this. One is that it uses a high-intensity LED light source. The other is that there's an internal battery that will provide up to six hours of power if the main power goes out. And the other thing that was very unique about this was that it has an adjustable interface at the front end that looks a lot like a, uh, a drill chuck or a collet that can accept many different types of inputs from different types of laparoscopes. Another project that uh, we worked on was a surgical light, and this one is actually very difficult. We've worked on this for, uh, for the last couple of years, and the, uh, the challenge, of course, is how do we get good, reliable surgical lighting in some areas that don't have access to reliable power and can't afford a thirty to $40,000 light system? If I'm building a new operating uh, room here at the University of Utah and I'm going to put a new uh, new operating, uh, new surgical light in, 
it's going to cost me about thirty or forty thousand dollars even with inexpensive LEDs uh, this is this is the state of the art we know that low-cost LED technology is uh, breaking new ground every day matter of fact if you saw the Super Bowl this year you saw an ad for Audi and they were touting the world's first LED headlamps so LED technology will take over and uh, and the students are starting to integrate this into some of the light ideas we have some very talented students working on this and a great designer this is some of the sketches that they're um, that they're using this semester in order to come up with their designs they're, they're actually building some prototypes now there's a poster uh, on this side of the room that explains their concept so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about this one of the challenges that we ran into when we started thinking about these uh, these projects however was how do we get this into the field how do we get this into the market Ray had told us that part of his dream was to create sustainable business enterprises where this wasn't a business where we would build these devices here and ship them overseas, that this would be uh, just like uh, Jeff Tabin explained yesterday with the Aravind Eye Center and the Tilganga Eye Center where these devices could be made locally. That creates a lot of constraints when we're talking about high-tech design and we started to explore some sustainable business models with a small group of students in a separate class. How can these business models uh, create social impact? What sorts of designs and technologies can be adaptable in low resource economies? What about marketing and competition? Does that come into play in these types of businesses like, uh, like the marketing and competition does certainly in this company, country? What about distribution, manufacturing, energy uses, uh, funding and finance and sustainability? We started to explore this a little bit more and we figured out that the bottom line doesn't add up. You don't have to go very far in an income statement and take a look at your gross profit and your net profit and understand that the cost of labor is prohibitive for us to develop and engineer and manufacture extremely affordable solutions in this country. The students put together an income statement. This is a, a busy slide, but uh, we can plug in the annual sale of units. So if you see on the left hand side, we have uh, half a million units that sell for a dollar each. And at the very bottom under expenses, you see there's a $200,000 line for wages, um, which we would assume would be the sort of scale of wages that we would have to have in this country in order to make an operation like this successful. And we have a money losing enterprise. On the right hand side is a potential surgical light source. We're selling 500 surgical lights per year. They cost $300 each. And if you go all the way to the bottom, you see that the wages are around $25,000. This is a realistic wage for two to three workers in a resource poor environment, but it doesn't really address the question of manufacturing. One of the students, uh, Christopher Pagels brought in a book, Business Model Generation. This is by uh, Andreas Osterwalder and his colleagues that talks about a process that you can go through in order to look at some of the key elements of innovative business models. Uh, there's a business model canvas that you can go through. There are a number of building blocks that the students looked at as they went through this. Customer segments, value propositions, channels, customer relationships, revenue streams. How do all of these things tie together? What are the key resources? What are the key activities? What are the key partnerships and the cost structure? This is a very non-conventional approach to putting together a business plan that you would sell to an entrepreneur to try to raise capital. This is what the actual business model canvas uh, looked like after they worked on it for a few days. There were sticky notes all over the place. It was actually quite a bit messier than this until they cleaned it up and they developed a very um, the very unique, I think, business model. They asked the question, suppose a university or an institution or a non-governmental organization were to sponsor a business and there were, an in, there, there, there's an institution-based business and that institution-based business is run by students. It's a not-for-profit enterprise. The students don't require salary. There's faculty volunteer help, and there is help from business students, law students, and other entrepreneurial types at the university who do not draw a salary. 
that institution-based business can develop the uh, business model as well as the engineering documentation and specifications. They can contract with a manufacturer, and in the case of our light source, we would, uh, we would leverage this with a local provider of lights, and that's Black Diamond. Black Diamond Manufacturing builds hundreds of thousands of headlamps every year, and they have relationships at factories in China that provide the electronics and the illumination technology, and that that factory could actually box up these relatively high-tech components, low cost but high-tech, they could box them up into a package, what we call the IKEA model, and that package gets shipped to what the students are calling a partner. This partner entrepreneur would be in the uh, low resource uh, setting and they would have a facility that provides storage, assembly, and they're responsible for the distribution. So it's a little bit like a franchise model. It's, a, it's certainly a partnership model. And that that partner or entrepreneur is responsible for providing light. Not selling a light, but per, for providing light, where they can, um, they can address issues of service, distribution channel, and follow on ideas. They provide the feedback back to the company, and this becomes a holistic type of business model. What I like about this is we're not just innovating the design solutions, but the students are innovating the business solutions as well. We don't know if this will work, but it's certainly not a conventional business model that you would see coming out of an engineering college at the University of Utah. So in conclusion for this introduction to what we're doing here at the university and what we've done over the last couple of years. Uh, extremely affordable bottom line profits have to be financial. They can't be a money losing proposition. We can provide useful products and good outcomes to people in other parts of the world and a sustainable level of profits for what we consider sustainable here in this country doesn't mean that that level has to be approached in other parts of the world as well people. We have to address the bottom line issue of people, that these types of solutions, these innovative business models and designs can improve outcomes for patients and can provide jobs in other parts of the world. The planet. Single-use disposable medical devices are thrown away every day. If you look at the, uh, if you go to a, a uh, knee replacement surgery, they're throwing away, I think, eight to ten large garbage bags. Those, uh, that waste product goes into the incinerator, typically. It's not considered to be general household garbage. It gets incinerated. It ends up in the air. So we often think about LCA, which is life cycle analysis and resource utilization, when we develop these extremely affordable solutions. And the last bottom line element is education. It, this provides a significant educational opportunity for the students here as well as for the global partners that may be involved in this enterprise. 